Okay, so this is the second um, part of the, the um, this lecture. So I'm just going to to run through it. So uh, the introduction to the industry. So here we actually get to chapter one of um, this, of Cook and Williams. So control is not possible without a plan and without a program. There is no effective means of exercising control. Successful control cannot happen in a vacuum. Nothing is typical um, about the construction industry. And one of the big problems in construction is the extent of separa separation between the design and production. Okay. So the in, in, um, in the in industry structure, the Department of Business Enterprise and Regulatory Reform uh, in 2007 reports in the construction industry made up some 186,000 firms. So this is in chapter one of your Cook and Williams. You will see this is old data, but it still gives us some um, good information on what exactly happens. It found that 1% of large firms employing over 80 people, this was in the UK, and 6% are medium sized employed between 14 and 79 uh, people. Okay, it's very similar to South Africa. Um, 93% of small firms employing less than 14 people. Okay, looking at permanent staff. So what I've done is I've just uh, took this from the construction industry report of 2017. I think th uh, this was the latest one. I haven't published one now recently. Um, I think uh, they indicated that there will be one um, in this year um, just to update the industry. So I just wanted to highlight some items here. So if you're a registered CIDB graded contractor, this is more or less the categories. So you will see um, category one. These are um, businesses that um, have a smaller turnover for the, um, the financials and then um, up to a designation nine where um, contractors have large um, turnover, which will be able to do projects over 200 million and carry that capital actually. So the law, this is just the indication of the financials of the contractors, the size of the project that they can uh, take on, etc. You will also see that you've got a CEEB, um, EP, etc. So we usually look at, look at CE, which is our civil uh, contractors and GB, which is our building contractors. Then you've got your mechanical, specialist glass works, electrical, and then there's a couple of others that's not listed here. But it's interesting to see the, um, we've got quite a lot of civil contractors and also a lot of building contractors. Okay, and you will see there's a lot of uh, new contractors coming in and only a couple like your um, old group fives, which you had um, your Robexes, uh, um, Rubicons and those. Uh, although, yeah, I'm not sure about Rubicon, whether they fall within this, uh, in which categories they fall. But these are your larger, more well-known uh, companies. Uh, and you can see how um, the distribution looks. So it's very similar to the British um, feedback that we had there on the first slide. Okay, and then it's just broken down into uh, the Eastern Cape, Free State, Gauteng, etc. And you will see that Gauteng by far is the highest, followed by the Western Cape. Uh, although the Eastern Cape is higher, Western Cape is actually not that much of up and coming uh, contractors. But interesting, if you go to the larger contractors, the Western Cape has um, quite a lot. Uh, over other provinces. So very interesting in information that you can source. You can also have a look at um, if the latest uh, report is maybe published already. Okay, then we get to the industry culture. There's nothing typical about the cust customs and practices in, in the construction, as many of you have um, probably noticed, noticed already. One big challenge is the extent to which industry separates design from production, far more than other industries especially in 
our environment where um, we've got the consultants, you, um, you do this design, it goes out on tender and the contract is priced for that. So it's very, fairly much the tradition that we've got here in South Africa. We work in a fragmented project-based industry, very um, important and I think probably one of the biggest challenges on any project is uh, you've got so many silos of um, in the industry um, and not everyone is really converged, um, knows about all of the things. That's where the contractors come in quite handy because this, they're constantly sourcing new materials from suppliers, different suppliers, etc. And, and that's why they have quite a nice background and a lot of information for um, that they can bring to the table. Okay, then we look at the reports. I'm going to not focus too much on the reports um, because everything is contained in in the uh, book. Uh, please read through that. It's very important to go through it. But I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. So from the Lathan report, which was done in two th uh, 1994, you can see that mistrust between participants is um, something which I highlighted. Sensitivity to government spending, intensive competition work, inability to re um, respond to increased demands, lack of competency tests confirmed, lack of training, in, um, inadequate capital base, adverse um, ad attitudes, claim contractors, high level of insolvency. Fairly much the same challenges that we've got today. Then the Latham report uh, towards planning production, they made some recommendations a real cost reduction of 30% by 2000 they wanted to produce. Now we're getting to that point where um, through a time we actually have increased production like uh, for instance prefab um, construction methods is picking up. The main thing driving um, all of these goals that they've got is viability and cost. Um, and uh, someone in the construction industry <coughs> will follow the path of least resistance to get the project done as quickly as possible to make as much as much money as possible so it um, the construction industry or many firms won't necessarily implement new technology um, or processes if um, they don't have time and money for it so um, that's me much of the time a, a reason why um, the construction industry progresses so slowly because it it's a risk that everyone has to take because you can imagine if you have to take a risk on uh, building uh, on a 30 million building and if you've um, decided to go lightweight steel and now suddenly you have a challenge later on which might even cause that the project um, or the building cannot be occupied. That is a major risk to the contract um, client, to the contractor, to everyone involved, because who's going to take responsibility for that? So that is one of the biggest um, uh, challenges for implementing new processes um, on on sites. A, a good example of that is, for instance, if you um, look at lightweight steel um, homes in South Africa, most uh, clients or home owners won't necessarily take that risk because is it going to <clears throat> have the same lifespan as a brick and mortar one, um, the sound between the walls, the soundproofing, etc. Even though you've got a, a better R value on the project, it doesn't necessarily um, mean that your soundproofing will be the same. So, but the, the, it's the biggest capital um, investment that the client or the homeowner will make. So he doesn't want to make a mistake. So people will stick to the things that most people um, are using at that stage, which is br brick and mortar. It's a safer route. Um, most contractors are familiar with it, etc. Whereas if you go to Australia, lightweight steel is um, commonplace there and um, people use that um, much off, uh, much more often. often. Um, and also you do, uh, the cash, uh, the possibility of having a saving uh, using a system like that, it, uh, doesn't justify the risk 
that you're going to take. So all of these things play into how uh, new technologies is implemented. Then the Latham report, uh, he concluded that most effect, um, effective from the contract should be specific duties for parties to deal fairly with each other, take all steps necessary to avoid changes where they do occur. Stuff that we already know, which has become commonplace, that we look at when, whenever we do the contracts. The conclusion uh, from the report was steps to improve productivity, better quality design and improve briefing of designers, um, challenges to trade and professional training education, improving the image of the in industry, encourage fewer disputes by encouraging partnering. This is quite an um, important um, item which has um, in many sections um, actually started and then improve quality of construction professional contractors and subcontractors. Uh, publication of report from 12 working groups and, and device, uh, diverse groups. So yeah, just this last point is not that important. It's just basically um, looking at the 12 groups um, of, um, of the industry, home building, civil engineering, etc., etc. Then we look at the Egan report, which came four years later, um, and it was a shorter report. Um, yeah, again, they proposed a bit more partnership, long term relationships, and then five key drivers of change was identified. Uh, committed leadership, fo uh, focus on the customer, integrated processes, teams, quality driven agenda, commitment to people okay so um, I think with BIM coming in um, and the processes of design um, the design processes and the ability to share more information um, easier between the parties we actually are achieving some of these um, items identified um, but it's still a long way to go then there was a second Egan report, which was published in 2002, and then they highlighted the need for, uh, for the client uh, leadership, uh, the need for integrated teams and supply chains, and people issues, health and safety became uh, quite important at this stage. Um, emphasis was still on collaborative um, collabora collaboration between the parties. The report suggested five steps for clients when considering a build. Verification of the need, assessment of the options, development of pro a procurement strategy. This might seem um, as if it should be in place, but not everyone has this procurement strategy really in place. Procurement uh, or project delivery, project uh, review. Uh, again, that's the closeout um, section where you actually have a look at what did we learn from this project? How can we implement it into the next um, next project? The challenge is usually the project team um, goes to different sites and it's not necessarily the same project team that works on the next project. Okay, then the National Audit Report. Okay, then this is um, just very interesting to see. 70 Three percent of construction projects of government were over budget. Seventy percent was late. The main reason: adverse relationships that exist between the construction firms. Long-term collaboration was emphasised after this report. So this is from the UK. So um, I think uh, this third point is um, not really. Um, it's less applic applicable uh, in the construction industry. But um, these percentages, I think, is fairly close to what we've got in South Africa. OK, and then I just posted a little break for, for the lectures. Um, and you can go through that and just have a look. And that is the f um, first content lecture, if I can call it that, um, our second lecture. So thanks for tuning in. And please remember to go through your uh, material as we've gone through it. Uh, during the lectures.